Welcome to this presentation on undue hardship. This is the second of three webcasts describing duty to accommodate in the workplace. My name is Carolyn Ormsby, and I will be hosting this webcast along with my colleague, Jessica Snow. We are both with the Alberta Human Rights Commission. Please note that the human rights legislation referred to in this webcast is the Alberta Human Rights Act. The commission referenced is the Alberta Human Rights Commission. If you have a human rights concern with an organization that falls under federal authority or if it falls under another provincial or territorial authority outside of Alberta, check with the Federal, Provincial, or Territorial Human Rights Commission in that jurisdiction for more information. It is important to note that the information presented in this webcast is not legal advice. It's information to increase your understanding of the Commission's duty to accommodate process under the Alberta Human Rights Act. I'll now hand this over to Jessica. Thanks, Carolyn. This webcast will provide an understanding of what constitutes undue hardship when there is a request for accommodation. The key concepts in the duty to accommodate are areas and grounds of discrimination in the Alberta Human Rights Act, undue hardship, and bona fide occupational requirement as a defense to discrimination. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that an employer has a legal duty to take reasonable steps to the point of undue hardship to adopt policies or conditions of work to accommodate an employee's individual needs based on a protected ground. This duty applies to all the areas and grounds of discrimination under the Alberta Human Rights Act. Accommodation ensures that all employees have equal opportunities to participate in the workplace. Accommodation is required by law and is not a courtesy afforded by the employer. Failing to provide accommodation to the point of undue hardship may be a contravention of the Alberta Human Rights Act, and the person seeking the accommodation may have the basis to make a complaint with the Alberta Human Rights Commission. To substantiate a claim of undue hardship, an employer must show that they would experience more than a minor inconvenience. In most cases, accommodation measures are simple and affordable and do not create undue hardship. Jessica, how is undue hardship defined? Undue hardship occurs if the accommodation would create onerous conditions for an employer. For example, intolerable financial costs or serious disruptions to the business. The Supreme Court of Canada has said that the hardship must be substantial in nature in order to be an undue hardship. What are the factors that the employer needs to consider in assessing undue hardship? An employer must take reasonable efforts to find an appropriate accommodation for an employee. Some hardship may be necessary in providing an accommodation. Only when there is undue hardship can the employer claim that they have tried all the accommodation options available. To determine if undue hardship would occur, the employer should review several factors. Where safety is a concern, the employer must consider the level of risk and who bears the risk. For example, consider if the accommodation would violate health and safety regulations. It would be undue hardship if accommodation impacted on the safety of the other employees. Determine the extent to which the inconvenience would prevent the employer from carrying out essential business operations. For example, if there is no productive work available to offer the employee, accommodation may be an undue hardship. What's the impact of the accommodation on other employees and on the collective agreement? For example, if the accommodation causes an increased workload on other employees and as a result, they're required to work many hours of overtime. A substantial departure from the collective agreement could also be a serious concern. Whether an employer could relocate employees to other positions on a temporary or permanent basis is a factor in determining undue hardship. This may be easier for a large company than a small three-person organization. The cost of modifying premises or equipment and the ability to amortize such costs should be taken into consideration. The larger the organization, the more likely that it can afford to support a wide range of accommodation options. Finally, financial costs must be substantial in order to cause undue hardship. <laughs> 
The cost must be so significant that they would substantially affect the productivity or efficiency of the employer. Thank you so much. Are there other considerations that would help employers assess undue hardship? Yes, there are. It would be helpful for employers to consider the following questions. Do all employees have to adhere to the standard, rule, or policy? Is there another way to do the job that would meet the need of the person requesting the accommodation? Were alternatives considered? If there were alternatives, why were those not chosen? And were other employees and or the union in unionized workplaces consulted? If not, why weren't they consulted? To illustrate how important it is to consider alternatives, we will now present a short five-minute video called Alice's Story. It's a scenario of workplace accommodation. And as you're watching the video, think about the actions the manager could have taken to accommodate Alice. I loved skiing. I loved the speed and the sense of freedom. After the accident, it, it took a while for me to accept that, you know, this had really happened to me. I found it hard to accept that it was all over. I got depressed, you know. Why did this have to happen to me? Anyway, I took it very hard. I stayed in bed for weeks. I just couldn't stop crying. The people I work with, they're a great crowd. They kept coming over to see me, to cheer me up. Finally, they talked me into doing some architectural work at home. That helped me get back into the swing of things. I was really lucky that the company had kept my job open for me. It was a funny sensation being back there. Everything was the same, but it looked quite different from the wheelchair. Alice? Is that you? Hey! You look great! <laughs> Wonderful to have you back again, Alice. It's, <laughs> I heard that you uh, took things kind of hard there for a while. <laughs> Mr. Young, have you got a minute? Sure. What's the problem? It's my drawing board. It's uh, too high for me. Well, the drafting table too. In fact, there's a lot of stuff that I can't reach. I can't reach anymore. There's no reason to get upset. I'm not upset. Well, I, I heard that you get pretty teary and upset sometimes. Nothing to get upset about. Mr. Young, I was suffering from clinical depression. And yes, I was pretty upset for quite a long time. I can assure you it's quite a normal reaction when you have a drastic change in lifestyle. I'm fine now. Really, I am. Mr. Young, the drawing board? What about the meetings and the deadlines? Pardon me? Well, you know, they can be pretty stressful. Uh, what if you can't handle it? What if you have another, uh, I mean, what would we do then? I was suffering from depression. I'm not now. 
I can handle the deadlines as well as I did in the past, and the meetings. No. If you remember, I didn't go to the meetings anyway. Now, back to the drawing board. I don't know if I can justify the expense and the uh, disruption to adapt the office for you. I mean, not when we really don't know if you can, you know, if you're gonna... Not when we really don't know how long you're gonna be working here. It was a tough adjustment, but I made it. And now, to be treated as if I was an unstable emotional time bomb, that's just not fair. I can barely reach my drawing board, let alone work at it. And he's not prepared to do anything about it. No one wants businesses to go broke. Employers are not expected to suffer undue hardship in order to accommodate an employee. It's not unreasonable to expect Mr. Young to make a few adjustments to Alice's drafting table, to her work environment, or to her schedule. He should be able to accommodate her physical disability just fine. And regarding her depression, if Allison's doctor has said she is ready to return to work, Mr. Young should welcome her back. You may want to press pause and take a few seconds to list all the actions the manager could have taken to accommodate Alice. Press play when you're ready to continue. Jessica, what actions could the manager have taken to accommodate Alice? Well, the manager should have confirmed Alice's date of return to the workplace. In the video, he seemed surprised that she was back at work. He could have asked her to provide a medical certificate to confirm when she would be returning to work. The manager should also have set up a meeting with Alice to discuss her job responsibilities and to find out the accommodation she needed. The manager could have also made the workplace more welcoming to Alice by removing the chairs to make it easier for her to move around her workspace. Furthermore, he could have ensured that the desks, drawing tables, and bookshelves that she used were lowered and accessible for her. Alice had informed the manager that she was suffering from depression after her accident, and he assumed that she would have another episode of depression and wouldn't be able to do her job. Once Alice's physician deemed her ready to return to work and didn't place any restrictions, the manager should have allowed her to resume all her responsibilities. Finally, the manager said he couldn't justify the disruption and cost to the employer as he didn't know how long she would be working. As we mentioned earlier, the employer may have to incur some inconvenience or cost in order to provide the accommodation. Only if the cost was substantial in nature could the employer show that it was an undue hardship. I will now turn this back to Carolyn, who will describe some of the resources that are available from the Commission. For more information or to access our resources, please visit our website at albertahumanrights.ab.ca. The Commission has materials that can be downloaded, such as our information sheets titled Protected Areas and Grounds Under the Alberta Human Rights Act, Employment, Duty to Accommodate, Obtaining and Responding to Medical Information in the Workplace, a Summary for Employers, and Obtaining and Responding to Medical Information in the Workplace, a Summary for Employees. We also have more in-depth resources, such as our Human Rights Guides, titled Duty to Accommodate, Duty to Accommodate Students with Disabilities in Post-Secondary Educational Institutions, Defenses to Human Rights Complaints, and lastly, Obtaining and Responding to Medical Information in the Workplace. You may wish to view our webcast on the Alberta Human Rights Act as well as the other two webcasts in our Duty to Accommodate series. They are An Overview of Duty to Accommodate and Bonafide Occupational Requirement. Find those and other Commission videos on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Alberta Human Rights. You can also link to our channel from the e-learning page on the Commission's website. 
If you have questions on a specific situation or if you want to determine whether you may have the basis to make a human rights complaint, please phone the Commission's confidential inquiry line. If you're north of Red Deer, call the Northern Regional Office at 780-427-7661. If you're south of or in the city of Red Deer, call the Southern Regional Office at 403-297-6571. To call those numbers toll-free within Alberta, dial 310-0000, then enter the area code and phone number. This brings us to the end of the presentation on undue hardship. Thank you for your interest in human rights-related issues, and we hope that you will join us again for future webcasts.